to have, uh, we feel very glad and of course very grateful to Venerable Chang for accepting our invitation from the Colchester Dhamma Center um, uh, to give this talk to our audience and to of course all of our friends and devotees who have also tuned into today's session. I am really hopeful and I am sure that this session to most of the ladies who are also here would be an inspirational talk also specifically to because we do really come across bhikkhunis, venerables like Chanda who have gone across the world practicing and being uh, operating under prominent teachers as venerable Acham Brahman. So, and also with regards to his team project, the Anukampa Bhikkhuni project. So without further ado, with much respect, I would like to uh, welcome Venerable Chanda to speak on her life and to deliver the talk. Thank you very much, Bente, and it's a great honour to be here today. So thank you for um, organising this. I'm just going to ah. unmute your mic a little bit. Yes. Wonderful. Great. So thank you very much, Bente, for inviting me today and for organising this session. It's really an honour to be here with everybody. And I'm very grateful to meet you too. It's lovely to meet a fellow monastic and a Dhamma brother. And hopefully I'll be able to invite you to Oxford at some stage along the way. So thank you very much. And uh, really lovely to see so many people here this afternoon. Many of you have been in my morning session, the Metta session, and you've come back for more. So this is a good sign that there's a thirst for the Dhamma in England. And um, yeah, my journey started in England, not so very far from Oxford, in uh, Chesterfield, where I was brought up. And uh, my upbringing looked very normal by most standards. I was lucky to have a stable um, family, a very loving parents and uh, good friends at school and uh, all the kind of blessings of being born in a safe country with good health care and, you know, a good education system. Um, and I guess, you know, the question is always there from childhood, what are you going to be when you grow up? And I could never really answer that question, but in my teens, um, the question became increasingly incessant, you know, this was the time when I had to start thinking about what I'd do at college and whether I'd go to college. And suddenly I started to ask a lot of questions. Like, is this really what I want to do with my life? You know? Because this is what I could see everyone else around me was doing. And they were reasonably happy. But somehow I felt there must be more. And for me, I, I remember watching the news from time to time with my parents. And, you know, the same old stories, war and famine power and greed and you know most people seem to be taking this in their stride quite used to the kind of stories that we hear but it really shook me and I felt that something here is amiss you know why is there so much suffering why do human beings harm each other the way that they do and what is the purpose of it all you know if there is so much suffering in the world is that just needless suffering or is there really a purpose and also, what is a compassionate response? You know, how can I respond in a compassionate way to that suffering and in a way that makes sense of it and that maybe seeks an end to that? And these were the kind of thoughts that were going on in my head, but I couldn't really string them together at that age. I was about 15. Um, but I felt that I needed to expand my horizons. And fortunately, I had a very close best friend and we sort of came up with this plan to go to India as soon as we could, actually. And uh, for me, it was before going to university. And so we travelled to India in search of something. And I really had no idea what it was. I mean, now when I look back at my journey, I think, why India? You know, was there some kind of connection there from past lives? Or why, why India, out of all places, from a small town in England? But I felt, as soon as I arrived in that country... I felt this vast sense of humanity and the interconnectedness of all of us. You know, it felt as though, yes, there was a lot of suffering, but there was also a kind of acceptance and understanding of that and a real sense of the impermanent nature of life. Life and death was very, very visible, very present in the streets. You know, death wasn't something that was taboo or that we didn't talk about. And at the same time, I could see that although there was, you know, the same sort of suffering that we get in every country and over there perhaps more in terms of poverty and all kinds of struggles, there was still a sense 
in general, that there was something more than my own individual existence. There was something more to life. And very soon into my journey over there, I started to hear about meditation. And I thought, this is really interesting, you know. I wonder what's really going on in my mind. And I'd already had an experience with feeling quite depressed in my teens, partly due to this suffering of not knowing why I'm really here. So I already had this sense that happiness isn't dependent on external conditions. Even if we have the perfect external conditions, as I say, a loving family, you know, doing well at school, good friends, still we're subject to suffering. And sometimes that suffering for me felt like more than I could hold, more than I could really understand the reason for. But I knew there must be a reason. And when I started to hear about the meditation, I thought, this is what I have to try. I have to sit with my own mind and watch what happens, you know, when I'm just alone and, uh, and learn about myself, right? Because our whole education system is about learning about the outside, learning about what happens in life, what happens, you know, in history and economics, whatever arena. But we never talk about learning about what's happening inside, so my first meditation retreat, I was 20 years old, and, um, and when I went for that retreat, it was a Vipassana retreat, so the focus was on being aware of my body sensations and looking at the way my mind was reacting to all of that. And what I started to realise, the first sort of insight, if you like, was that when I think I'm reacting to things outside, I'm actually reacting to sensations within myself. Those experiences, those objects of the senses outside come in contact with my senses, with my body and mind, and they create a sensation. And because of that contact, and because of this sensation, I react. So I'm never reacting to things outside. There's something in between, and that is these sensations in the body that we can be in direct contact with. And for me, this was really key because I understood that this is where we can start to weaken our craving, our reactivity. You know, we get a pleasant sensation, we want more of it. We meet somebody that we like, why do we like them? Because they make us feel good. And because we feel good, we want that sensation again and again and again. The same thing if we come in contact with something unpleasant or unwanted. We get an unpleasant feeling, an unpleasant mental reaction or emotional reaction. And because of that, there's... A, a wish to get rid of it, a wish to push it away. This is also a kind of craving, right? And so we're constantly reacting and, and you know, being repelled or enticed by the objects and experiences in the world. But now I had a way to understand how that's arising within me and how by developing some equanimity around that, developing some peace and some spaciousness around those experiences within myself, and understanding that these experiences change, you know, they're not fixed, they're actually arising and passing constantly, that really undermine the tendency of my mind to react and to create suffering for myself, right? So this was the first thing for me, the Buddha's focus on suffering and the fact that suffering arises from a cause, it arises from craving. And knowing that was so powerful because as soon as we realise that, we can start to look inwardly and we can start to address the cause instead of trying to amend all the external kind of manifestations of suffering. We can actually go right inside and look at the cause, where this is coming from. And so I was very fortunate to start this kind of practice without really knowing anything about Buddhism as a, as a religion because it had immediate effect. And the first thing I felt was enormous sense of hope and an enormous sense of meaning that this was really the purpose of my life. I knew that I wanted to just take this as deeply as I could for the rest of my life. And I don't know where that faith came from. It was partly experiential because it just made so much sense and I already felt more balanced and lighter and an enormous sense of relief. But it may also be to do with perhaps being on this journey in previous lives. Who knows? I just knew that I wanted to make this the focus of my life and I was in a position to basically, I didn't have responsibilities, I didn't have reasons to come back necessarily. So I spent the next seven years of my life living in Asia, mostly in India, Nepal, uh, in Thailand and Burma. I never went to Sri Lanka, which is strange, I'm not quite sure why, but most of the meditation centres where I practised were in India and Nepal. 
And so I would work a little bit along the way wherever I could find some sort of, you know, job that was fairly easy, like traveller's jobs, you know. So I went to um, South Korea and for a while I taught there, taught English and then decided to sell jewellery instead because it was easier to make money quickly and then get back to India to practice. So I lived like this for several years, just focusing everything on trying to establish myself in the Dhamma. And I think I'm very grateful to my first teacher, Goenka. He's um, a Burmese businessman, actually, Indian origin. Um, and many monastics start off with Goenkaji because the courses are so accessible and available on a donation basis. And um, the other thing that I really learned from him was the importance of service in the development of meditation. And from the beginning, I understood that. And I would give as much time to serving on retreats as to sitting them myself. And this really helped me widen the perspective for my own personal spiritual journey and sometimes challenges and struggles to something that was much more universal. And so I could understand that the kind of experiences that I was having were universal to all beings. Maybe they manifested slightly differently, you know, different backgrounds, different cultures, different economic situations that we all have. But ultimately, we're all subject to the same sufferings, yeah? The sufferings born of greed, hatred and delusion. So this was wonderful. And the whole time when I was practicing, I was increasingly sure that I want to become a nun. And uh, Bante has asked me to talk also specifically about how that affected me as a woman and what my journey was like as a woman seeking aspiration. And I think one of the first things was that it took so long to find a suitable place. You know, I was asking my teachers, I was asking my friends and all the Dhamma brothers and sisters that I'd meet along the way, where can I ordain? How can I find an opportunity? Do you know a teacher? And nobody knew. I even wrote to Goenkaji and he gave me a very encouraging letter. He said that it's definitely a noble thing to do and one who ordains makes quick progress on the path. But he also couldn't advise me. And with a lot of integrity, he said that was because he was a lay person and he hadn't ordained himself, which I thought was very um, sincere. But he definitely encouraged it, you know, contrary to what some people do believe about, about SN Goenka. He did encourage me to ordain. So finally, after about 10 years of practice and travelling and coming back to India to meditate, I heard about my teacher who was to become my teacher in Burma. And it's funny sometimes when you meet teachers, because just the hearing of him, I just knew this is my teacher and I have to ordain. At that time, I'd actually not given up hope, but I'd taken a little bit of a detour and come back to England to study Indian medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, because I just didn't have a monastery in sight. But this was only something like a backup plan. So when I heard about my teacher, I went straight over to Burma in the next summer holiday and I took temporary ordination. And I think this is the first time I'd met somebody who really developed the practice to a very deep level. And the metta and the kindness that would radiate from him was just extraordinary. I remember the first time that we met in his monastery, in the forest monastery, and he walked towards my kuti. And I had this thought in my mind, this is why they say the Buddha had these lights radiating from him, these different coloured lights. Because it really felt like there was this radiant presence of benevolence. And in such an atmosphere, I was such a happy nun. <laughs> Even though I hadn't yet had the chance to take the full ordination, the conditions were there. It was a very, very basic monastery in Morbi, for anyone who's Burmese. Um, we had to take a local bus, which took about two hours in the sweltering heat, and then travel on a motorbike uh, taxi, or else in a little kind of jeepney, where every time it banged, you know, you'd hit your head on the ceiling. And, uh, and we'd always say, well, we're nuns, so we shouldn't have to pay, because monks didn't have to pay, right? So then they'd say, mm, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'd get to the entrance to the monastery which was basically a red dirt track and we'd have to walk the last two miles so by the time we arrived you know as young nuns the robes would be falling off and we'd be completely drenched with sweat in that humidity but every time I got back there I just felt like I was in a, the deva realm 
It just felt so conducive to practice. And this is part of the first, one of the first steps of training, simplicity and contentment with little. Yeah? In a sense, you clearing out the complexities of life, simplifying, just living in a small heart, that simplicity makes space for something else. And that something else was a full-hearted commitment to practice. So we used to sit in this meditation hall with no windows, no mosquito nets or coils. You know, the mosquitoes would come straight in and out again after having a good old nibble. There was no electricity. Um, The first time I arrived, there wasn't even a kitchen. The food was just cooked on a little um, wood kind of uh, bonfire, really, outdoors. So it all tasted very smoky and not very good for the tummy. Uh, But I was so happy. I was just so filled with delight and gladness at having found this opportunity to practice and to have the support, the spiritual support of such a great teacher. So I went back to finish my degree because I felt I owed it to my parents and I owed it to the to the college lecturers and to myself just to finish what I started, you know. But I was very, very clear that I was going back afterwards to ordain for good. And my teacher, when I came back, he actually asked me, is it for life? And I said, yes. <laughs> very sure of myself. And he said, in that case, I'll make you a cootie. And a few years later, he actually did make me a special hut on top of a little hill. So there was a little waft of air that would blow past, but very slight. <laughs> Despite all these hardships, I was a very happy nun living there. But unfortunately, I got a, a parasite infection fairly early on. And this, of course, is after 10 years of also living in India and having many such infections and taking all kinds of antibiotics and things to try to cure my stomach. But when you're younger, at least in my case, I was probably quite reckless. So I'd just take the antibiotics and then carry on drinking the local water and, you know, living like a local with no money to speak of. (laughs) So by the time I got to Burma, I think my system was already quite run down. And unfortunately, this had an impact because I was only able to stay with my teacher there for about three or four years. During that time, also, there were visa problems and I had to leave the country to try and renew my visa and come back again. But during that time, I had the great privilege to be able to stay at Wat Pa Bantad with Acha Mahabura, who is also a great forest master in the Thai tradition. And this was a really pivotal experience for me as well because we had the opportunity to practice wakefulness and meditate throughout the day and night. And again, it was a very, very simple place. The kutis there were literally just um, a kind of wooden platform and it would have a little tin roof and then four curtain rails and from those curtain rails there was just a rubber curtain or a plastic curtain, quite thick to keep the monsoon rains away. But on that platform, all there was was like a tatami sleeping mat and some kind of lump for a pillow, like a brick. (laughs) And uh, so it was very conducive to staying awake and doing a lot of meditation. And I think at this time, I started to see the importance of um, really calming the mind. Until then, I'd been practicing mostly with the insight practices, but here I had the chance to deepen my samadhi. And, uh, and not knowing, actually, whether I'd get back again or not to Burma. During the time I was in Thailand, there was actually, it was the uprising in Burma, where the monks, it was called the Saffron Revolution by the press, where they um, started marching against the military dictatorship in Burma. And um, at that time, I, I really didn't know if my teacher and my community were safe. And we'd listen out for the news, and there'd be no news at all. I'd try and phone, but there was no you know, working phone connection. So I just really didn't know whether I'd get to go back again or not. A lot of uncertainty. And I went to India to do a long meditation retreat shortly after that. And I remember in that retreat thinking, so far in your life, the Dhammas always put you in the best place possible for you to develop. This is going to continue to happen. The Dhamma will make sure that you're always in a position to practice. And I really hung on to that. It felt like a deep sort of inner knowing. And luckily I did get my visa to go back. But as I said, the 
climate, the food, and the general intensity of being there sort of took its toll on my health. And it was after about four years of um, trying so hard to, to manage with that, that I finally realised I'd have to find a new way forward in my path. I was really chronically ill, and nothing would work. I went to hospitals in Thailand and got all the different treatments, but nobody could find a solution. And around the same time, I got in contact with my teacher, Ajahn Brahm, who I didn't know, of course, would become my teacher, but I just had these little CDs with some of his talks. And I had no idea that he was a well-known monk. I just put it on and listened. And the first thing that struck me was hearing the Dhamma in English. So far in Burma, I'd had to try to understand my teacher in Burmese. And we used to make uh, little tape recordings and then try and transcribe some of the words and ask one of the monks who spoke reasonable English to translate it to us. But this was a very piecemeal method of learning Burmese. And although it worked to the point where I could understand the meditation instructions and I could have my interview mostly in Burmese, it wasn't the same as just absorbing the Dhamma directly through someone speaking my own language. And the other thing I also realised was that he understood the Western psychology in ways that perhaps people in Burma or even in India might not. So in Burma there was this really strong kind of attitude of like striving and sitting for long, long hours, which I loved. I mean, I was very gung-ho. So we'd sit there for hours and be really, really in, enjoying the meditation, watching everything rise and pass away. But over time, I realised my body needed a gentler approach. yeah, And my mind needed to develop more contentment and more softness around the meditation object. So Ajahn Brahm's teaching spoke straight to my heart and straight to where I was at in the practice. And I knew from hearing the talks, I only heard a few, two or three, and I thought, I have to go and meet this teacher. At that time, I had no idea where he even lived, whether he accepted nuns, um, no idea whether it would be possible for me to train with him or not. But I literally took a leap of faith. I felt like there was nothing that could stop me. I had to meet this teacher. And so... Um, in 2010, I left Burma, and I, I was fortunate enough to meet him in Germany that year. And I told him, you know, I want to come to Australia, and I want to train. But at that time, he said everything was full. The nuns' monastery was full. And of course, by now, I was starting to realise that as a nun, there were very few options, right? For a monk, if it doesn't work in one place, you can go to another monastery, to another teacher, but for a nun, there were very few options. Yeah. I was so lucky in Burma with my teacher that he did provide us very good facilities and he would even tell the lay people, you must support the nuns. The nuns are very diligent. They work and meditate very well. You know, don't only give to the monks. Support the nuns as well. But, you know, firstly, I realised that I wasn't fully ordained, so I wasn't considered a member of the wider Sangha. But secondly, that meant that there were also not so many places and not so many nuns who could teach me. So Ajahn Brahm told me that the monasteries in Perth were full, but that I could come for the rains retreat. And so two years later, after spending time in Amravati and Chithurst and other monasteries in Europe, I managed to get the chance to go to Perth. And when I arrived at Virginiana Monastery for my rains retreat, I had this really strong sense of this is how the Buddha taught. This is the atmosphere the Buddha would have created. It was a place of such safety and acceptance. Such incredible warmth. You know, you didn't have to prove anything. You didn't have to be anyone. And even this idea of how a monastic should behave, it was really encouraged to just be yourself. You know, to just come honestly as you are. And you would be respected and given this automatic sense of trust. And it sounds kind of funny to talk about great teachers such as Ajahn Brahm, you know, who are worthy of such great respect themselves, bestowing that respect on you, you know, like who am I to deserve such respect? But I think this is the characteristic of a heart which is so humble and sees beyond the self, that they respect and give this trust to all beings because they know our own potential having realised their potential for themselves. 
Yeah, so I immediately felt very accepted and the whole atmosphere was incredibly conducive to developing states of calm. And I also started to realise that um, I guess my approach to practice before was very much a linear kind of way of progress, which, you know, there was a lot of letting go and a lot of insight that could arise, but there was still a sense of me doing the practice. There's something in there observing what's happening. Everything's arising and passing, but there's someone seeing that. There's a person in there who has to work, who has to strive and become liberated. And now, coming to Ajahn Brahm's way of teaching, it was quite revolutionary for me. He was basically saying, the more you can get out of the way, the more a natural process can unfold. And so the practice started to take on a different momentum, and I became, like in a sense, the backseat driver And this was very conducive to an understanding of non-self, how things arise based on conditions and pass away according to conditions. And most of the time when I get involved, I just mess up that whole thing and actually make it worse. (laughs) So his focus was very much on setting the right attitude to practice from the beginning, really creating a lot of kindness, gentleness and peace in the mind. And from that perspective, allowing the breath in, allowing... Whatever wants to come in, whether it's thoughts or emotions that need attention, whether it's body sensations or breath. Yeah, so, so it was getting into a much less controlling way of practice. And of course, at the same time, I also realised that Ajahn Brahm had ordained bhikkhunis, right? And as I said, until then I hadn't thought about it much, but when I heard that it was actually possible to take the full ordination, my heart just leapt. And I thought, well, of course, I mean, if there's a chance, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? I'd already let go of so much. You know, I'd lived in Asia for so many years away from my family, had all this uncertainty around where I would practice, had to say goodbye to my first teacher. You know, this was really difficult and always keeping that trust, keeping that sense of renunciation and just allowing the path to unfold. And now... Suddenly there was this chance to ordain as a bikini. It just seems so obvious. Because I think when we ordain, we don't take half an ordination. We don't ordain with half a heart. It's a full renunciation. It's a full giving of ourselves to the Buddha's path. And so the bikini ordination for me felt very natural. It felt as though it was just confirming what I'd already what had already happened in my heart a long time ago. But the ordination itself had a very powerful Um, meaning for me because I was actually entering the Sangha for the very first time and this is the Sangha of bhikkhus and bhikkhunis right we also talk about the fourfold assembly which includes lay um, men and women but the, the real Sangha is the Sangha of bhikkhus and bhikkhunis and the Buddha said that he wouldn't pass away until this was established until the bhikkhus, the bhikkhunis and the lay men and lay women were well established in the Dhamma. So this was always the Buddha's intention. And unfortunately, that Bhikkhuni Sangha um, seemed to... um, I mean, maybe there were a few people who maintained it, but at least in the Theravada tradition, it was lost. But fortunately, it was preserved in the Mahayana tradition. And so when Ajahn Brahm was doing his research about ordaining bhikkhunis, he realised that we can take the ordination from a Mahayana non, from a Mahayana bhikkhuni, because they have essentially the same Vinaya, right? These different traditions are only on the surface, but they're essentially following the Dhammaguptaka Vinaya, which is the same ordination procedure and process. And as well as this, the Buddha had actually given an Allowance in the texts, it's in the Vinaya, the Chulavaga 10, um, verse 2 and 17. And he'd actually given a very clear text that in the absence of bhikkhus to perform an ordination, sorry, in the absence of bhikkhunis to perform an ordination ceremony, bhikkhus, monks can perform that ceremony and ordain women as bhikkhunis. Yeah? So there's still a lot of debate around this. But this clause is kept in the Vinaya, right? And then when he did ordain bhikkhunis, another clause came in to say that bhikkhunis are allowed to ordain bhikkhunis. But the previous one was not rescinded. 
So both of these allow and give the possibility for nuns to be ordained. And I think that shows the incredible foresight of the Buddha. You know, that he knew there may be a time when perhaps the Bhikkhuni Sangha would be lost. And he gave this possibility for it to be reinstated. Yeah. And so I managed to get a place at the nuns' monastery after a couple of years of being in Australia and had the chance to take the Bhikkhuni ordination. And uh, one of the beautiful things at the Bhikkhuni ordination that was chanted was to ask the Sangha to lift me up out of compassion into the Sangha and to take the Bhikkhuni ordination for the sake of attaining Nibbana, nothing less. That this is not about status in any way, this is not about wanting to prove a point or to just say I'm equal to monks, but it's really for our own liberation. And at the same time, this enables us to start to develop our own communities and to be independent from the Bhikkhu Sangha, which is so, so necessary. So my experience in Burma had shown me that there aren't enough places and that when you do have to leave, say, a foreign country because the food no longer suits your body or the climate is very difficult, where do we go? Where do we actually go? There is nowhere. And so in 2015, Ajahn Brahm asked me, it was kind of a, a, a kind of joking conversation where we both said, oh, yeah, maybe I should do something in England. And he said, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. That's what you should do. So he kind of asked me to do that, and a couple of months later, you know, I asked him again, were you serious? He said, yes, I really think that's what you should do. Give it a go and see what happens. And so I felt moved to do that out of compassion for the women that would follow, because it's all very well that I could meet a really good teacher in Burma. But as I say, it takes its toll, health-wise, language-wise, culture-wise, in many, many ways. And we need to have something that's sustainable for women going forward. Something like a legacy that other people can benefit from long after I'm gone. So right now, where you see me is in our first little vihara in Oxford. This is just a little four-bedroomed house. But it's the first time that bikinis, that fully ordained nuns, have actually had their own place to stay you know, that's come around entirely through the generosity of others in England and in Britain. So it's a really historical step. And from here, we hope to expand and to end up having a training monastery for women where many people can come and ordain. But as I say, this is very early days, and so this is the step in the right direction. And everybody that's here, everybody that's supporting me, that's coming to my talks, is all a very big part of that. Because this can only happen if other people want it to happen and if other people feel that, yes, indeed, women renunciants do have something to give. Yeah? We need to be more visible. Some people have written to tell me that you know, there's something different when a nun teaches. There's a greater, perhaps, empathy or just something that we can bring that maybe monks don't, in the same way that monks may have certain qualities that we don't. But even more than that, I would say that every individual has something very unique to bring, whether male, female, or gender neutral. It really doesn't matter. We're all unique, and we all experience the path in different ways. Yeah. So everybody's journey on this path is unique to them, and we all have so much to share. And I would really want to encourage everybody who's listening to just believe in yourself and trust the Dhamma. You know, the Dhamma was taught to all beings, the Buddha taught to bhikkhunis just as he taught to bhikkhus and to lay women and lay men. And there were many enlightened nuns, many enlightened lay women in the time of the Buddha who were great supporters and who supported the bhikkhuni sangha too. So we're keeping that legacy alive. And I really want to thank all my teachers along the way because I've learned so much from every one of them and I'm sure I'm going to keep continuing to learn a lot more. So I think that... Um, I've talked for the duration now, tried to cram it all in, but that was only a tiny little picture of how my journey's been. So thank you very much for listening, and I think questions and answers will ensue. Yes, thank <laughs> you so much, Venerable Nanda. Um, and uh, thank you so much. My, my face is hurting from smiling. <laughs> I'm sure this is the problem that you face as well. <laughs> Because you seem to be all smiles. Very good. So, Chana, I before we move on to a loving 
the audience who has gathered and tuned in today to ask questions from Verbal Chanda. So if you do have a question, uh, use the hands up option. I will unmute your mic and you can then ask Verbal Chanda uh, questions that you might have with regards to, I guess, Verbal Chanda is open to answering anything that you possibly could answer. <laughs> uh, uh, but to start it off, I have a couple of questions from Verbal Chanda. Um, what are the best traits, Venerable Chanda, you would say um, that a person should have, especially women, uh, in when they would sort of go into a nunnery or sort of consider becoming a nun? What mm. are the best traits to have uh, in that case? Okay, great. This is a question that um, I haven't really had time to think about, so it's really fun when these questions come up and I can just be spontaneous. The first thing that I would say is that they should love the Dhamma, a love of the Dhamma, a deep love of the Dhamma, and a real, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah? Um, a lot of confidence in the Dhamma, because the path of renunciation is just that, we're letting go of something to gain something more, to gain something deeper, yeah? And sometimes we have to let go of something for something else to arise. So that takes a lot of confidence. And I would also say patience, a lot of patience, and a lot of gentleness with oneself. Patience because we need to have patience in order to really find the conducive conditions which we feel may help us on our path. As I said, it took me 10 years to find a monastery where I knew this was where I want to ordain. And I wasn't wrong about that. I would have stayed there probably for the rest of my life had my health not failed. <laughs> but you don't look backwards in that way. You just look at, you know, the beautiful things that have come since then. But I think patience is really important and a kind of um, uh, dedicated commitment to seeking those conditions. Yeah. And then the other reason I said gentleness is because Many people may approach monastic life sometimes through a sense of lack, through thinking that there's perhaps something in them that's not good enough, something in them they haven't really accepted, and they want to almost trade identities. So life may be very difficult in the lay world, and there's this tendency to think, if we ordain, it'll all be better, it'll be much easier, it'll, I'll be able to kind of improve myself, make myself this new improved spiritual version of, of me. But there's a danger in that because I think until we've really embraced the difficult parts of our self, you know, maybe the unhealed traumas or the emotional wounds, um, we're always running away. And the practice of the Dhamma is to keep on coming back, keep on meeting whatever's arising with great amount of gentleness, trust and respect. Yeah? And to include all that, that's why I say that Ajahn Brahm for me was so inspiring because I could really see that he would accept anybody into his monastery and they would have a chance to grow. Wonderful. Thank you, Venerable Chanda. Um, another question that I have for you, Venerable Chanda, is uh, we do have a lot of uh, female community coming in and asking about, you know, Bhante, I'm thinking, should I get old in? But I do have all of these things going on. I do have my kids as well. Mm -hmm. You know, should I do it? Should I not? Venerable Chanda, what would you say to these yeah. questions? I mean, when is it right? How will you know? When will you know that it is the right time? That's such a good question. <laughs> Um, for me, the aspiration arose very strongly in my first or second retreat, and I let it grow. I just let it bubble away, and I let it grow, and I made myself ready. And I think I had this impression that to ordain you needed to be really, really solid, really, really well practiced, and, you know, having given a lot of service, and so I didn't rush it. I really made sure that, you know, I wasn't running away from anything. I made sure that I finished and completed my responsibilities, including my degree. Um, and then I initially ordained for three months. So this was a very good thing to do. And I think, you know, if you do still have responsibilities, you could always try temporary ordination, at least in an Asian country. That can be a possibility. But um, I think to really be very honest with yourself, what is your motivation? 
Is it that you're trying to run away from responsibilities or is it a sense that to ordain would give you the chance to really serve? Yeah? Because it should never be entirely self-interested. It should always be with this bigger sense of like wanting to give our lives, give ourselves in service to the Dhamma. Wonderful. Uh, what is the security that a woman should be looking for in deciding where to live as a nun, as a monastic. I mean, for monks, I know, you know, we, we have a lot of support mm. wherever that we go. But, you know, um, yeah. what is the security that women should be looking for? That's a, it's quite difficult, actually, because as I said, I mean, I felt that my situation in Burma was fairly secure. But of course, in the long run, I realized I don't have a permanent visa for that country. You know, the food and the climate didn't suit me in the longer term, so it wasn't very secure. I mean, I had the security in the sense of having a very good start in monastic life with good teachings, but then I was basically on my own. So I would say that if you are going to ordain and you're sort of, you know, you're probably not 20 years old, so you may have some, you know, family or property or something, don't give it all away straight away. And also, don't join a community without knowing that community. Go to different places and meet the communities. Spend some time in different places. Get to know, you know, where you feel a sense of friendship, a sense of support, where you feel that you're being respected, yeah? Perhaps where you feel that you have something to give. And take it slowly, yeah? And also, keep checking when you leave those communities how was my stay in that monastery? Did it really support me? Like, have the wholesome qualities increased? And have the unwholesome qualities decreased? Or do I now feel more miserable and more stressed and more like running away? So making sure that you can integrate what you learn in the monasteries, first of all, so that you feel it's fairly easy to move from one world to the other. This can be helpful, I think. But in terms of security, I mean, it would be... Hopefully that's what I can provide for people who, in this country at least, you know, that it will be a place where we have enough support and we can all work towards maintaining that support. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Chanda. And on a personal note, yeah. what is the Vinaya rule uh, that you found most difficult to practice oh. when you first became a Bikuni? The Vinaya rule that I find most difficult to practice. See, oh, when I first became Bhikkhuni, um, there's a lot of very subtle rules. There's a lot of very subtle rules. I think rules around speech are the hardest because at the um, practical level, the rules are quite easy and I've been keeping them for a long time anyway. So even as a not a fully ordained nun, I was living essentially the life of a bikuni. I hardly used... Okay, sometimes I use money, but it wasn't my money, it was donation money. So I would say when you're looking at the bikuni vinaya, it's things like speaking with respect, speaking um, words that promote harmony as opposed to words that divide. We have to be very, very careful about our intentions and motivations for the way we use language. I think that's an ongoing training and I think there's always more work to be done. So it's not a very obvious, oh, you've broken it or you've not broken it. Most of the time you haven't necessarily broken it, but I think the Vinaya shouldn't be seen as black or white. It should be seen as a kind of continuum. And there's always more we can do. Wonderful. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we have some questions on the chat section. So okay. uh, a person called C would like to ask, Rebel Chanda, given your conversation about women in Buddhism, May I also ask what Buddhism says about being a queer person? Okay. Um, I don't know that Buddhism says very much about that, but the Buddha didn't really talk about types of sexuality. He talked about lust, he talked about passion, he talked about this as being something that gradually through the practice we aim to overcome. But he didn't make any kind of value statements about queer people, heterosexual people. I don't think that he had this kind of biases. And I do believe there were queer people, gay people, lesbians in the Buddha's day, of course. This has always been the case. Even, you know, animals are gay and queer and whatever else can change gender spontaneously. 
So this is really part of nature. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing, you know, that you should feel stigmatized for being queer, being gay, being whatever, LGBTQIA+. <laughs> you all belong. So I'm not sure. I mean, there are some scholars who probably know more about it. Like there's something called a pandaka, which was a bit of a vague... Like, there's been a lot of discussion about what that means. Is it somebody with two types of genital, or is it somebody who maybe has had a sex change? It's not very clear. But there are some readings you can do on that if you want to research it more. Um, yeah. If I may also add something that yeah. happened with your permission. Please. Um, in, the, in the monastic code, in the Vinaya, we have occurrences that have been explained in great detail where there were um, sexual... Uh, circumstance or occurrences with regards to two males, mm -hmm. right? And with regards to the monks specifically. And the Buddha, the way that he answers or sort of when it is brought to his attention, he doesn't say, oh, this is wrong or anything like that. What he yeah. says is, this is lust. Yeah. One must get, a, get rid of lust. Lust is a burden for the enlight path of enlightenment. So in most of these uh, significant places where it is mentioned regarding uh, people of queer nature or whatnot, you know, the Buddha does not in any way put them down to the sexuality or the urges. He just says this is lust. Yeah. Right? Yeah. This is love. So just something to add on there. And and some people do believe that the word pandaka is is a word for queer people, but actually pandaka is not a word for queer people. The English translation is a eunuch. Right. And Buddhism, there are five types of eunuchs, and this is this is not at all anything to do with uh, gay, queer, lesbian, transgender. This is nothing to do with those kinds of people. Yeah. These are sort of uh, lustful mental tendencies that probably people would have, and also biological tendencies that could arise in certain Great. people. Just to put it out there, but for Chanda to support you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bente. That's really clear. <laughs> all right. Do we have any other questions? Uh, do we have any other questions uh, that you would like to ask? The floor is yours. Um, I will give you permission to unmute your mic if you do have a question. And I'm sure when the Chanda will answer it with all smiles. <laughs> <laughs> and please don't be shy. It can be about anything. Absolutely. Yeah. Before, up until we do get a question, for a person, you know, could you recommend any monastery that would um, be good for a person to, for a woman specifically? I'm focusing on the women today. Please excuse sure. me, men. You know, but we have enough talks <laughs> for mm -hmm. us. But today I'm focusing on the women. Uh, can you recommend any monasteries that a woman could go to? Uh, uh, in terms of practice, you know, up until your monastery comes up, you know, all the best with that. But before that, you know, where could a woman go to to have a good practice? Okay. Um, do you want me to do a little world review, or is this mostly in Europe? Or? <laughs> uh, just, just, just pick a few. Okay. From okay. Europe. I'll pick a few. Okay. Well, I would say that if you want to go to Burma to practice for meditation. Um, there are several monasteries. My monastery, my teacher actually moved to a place which is quite inaccessible now, so I can't recommend that. But there's um, Utejnir in Morbi, and there is the Pat Out Monastery, as you know, Bante, where you were trained in Burma. In both of these places, and in most um, monasteries in Burma, they act more like meditation centers. So men and women can go, and you can ordain temporarily or long term. So that's Asia, and I'm sure there are places in Sri Lanka that I'm not so familiar with. In America, there are quite a few bhikkhuni monasteries in California, which I would recommend. There's one called Aloka Vihara, which is really great. Some very lovely, mature bhikkhunis who trained previously at Amravati. There's also another small place with Aya Santusika as the abbot, who's also a very lovely bhikkhuni. In Europe, there is Tilorian Monastery, which I'm not sure is going to be a training monastery, but you can visit that in Belgium. There is also uh, Anenji Vihara in Germany, which I think is more like the Mahasi method. Um, you could go to Amravati in Chithurst, because they do have nuns at Amravati, but then you, you're not able to take the full ordination there. 
So although this might not seem to be an issue in the beginning, it often does seem to be later on in monastic life. It's like you're being told you're in the B class, and it has a psychological effect. So I would recommend that if you have any chance to, to ordain on equal footing to monks from the outset, this is really great. So there's a few little guidelines, and you can come and visit me. As we say, it's not a fully-fledged monastery yet, but the thing that will make it fully-fledged is when I get more aspirants and more long-term visitors. So we're starting something here. Amazing. Thank you, Chanda. <laughs> uh, we have a question from uh, one, of, um, uh, one of the attendees here. Uh, thank you, Venerable Chanda, for your inspiring talk. May I ask how you told your family of your decision to get ordained and how did they react? Well, <laughs> nice question. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully they're not listening. <laughs> yeah, well they might not remember, but I actually did warn them about this after my first or second retreat. <laughs> so that was way back in 1996. And uh, I remember saying to, to my mum and dad, like, someday I might like to become a nun. And I think over time, as time progressed, I would have become more and more adamant about that, you know, made it quite clear that that's what I was wanting to do. But I guess it seemed kind of quite a distant prospect. And, um, yeah, as I say, I went over for three months the first time during my degree, but I came back again. So I think my mum found it quite difficult to see my shaven head, but I was back in lay clothes, so she didn't worry too much. But then when I went back, when I told her I was going back again... I think that was quite hard because she felt like I'd come back to England and I was studying. So in a way, after all those years being away, she thought that I was back and then I went away. So I think it's always difficult, you know, wherever attachment is involved. It's bound to be difficult to have that separation. But at the same time, they've always been very respectful and supportive of my choices. And they've never tried to suggest that I should do things their way. So I think we have good communication and I explain to them what it's about. I explain to them what the meditation is and how it works. And they can basically see that I'm on a good path. It also helps when they meet people um, who are associated with this project or who come to some of Ajahn Brahm's talks and they can see that they're just people like them, you know. They're not all Buddhist. They're just people who are curious about the teachings and maybe want to have a fun evening even. So they have actually um, got a little bit involved now and do come to some talks. And also they came out to Burma to see me a couple of times. So I'm really proud of my parents for being so open-minded and so supportive, even though, of course, parents want you nearby. So I think it's a matter of dialogue, conversation, ongoing sharing of one's path is the best way to go. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from... We have a question from Nadine. Um, so she is asking, uh, what is the response to renewed bhikkhuni ordination in traditional Theravada countries now? Has there been growing has there been growing acceptance? Also, how was your personal experience with male Sangha before and after your ordination? Hmm. That's interesting. Okay, well, um, as far as the acceptance across traditional Buddhist countries, I'm not an expert on these things because I did come to this more from a practice perspective and I haven't done a lot of research into this. But as far as I understand, nothing's changed in Burma that's still actually illegal to take the bhikkhuni ordination, which is very sad. And there have actually been women put in prison for that. I met a bhikkhuni there once and um, I stayed with her shortly. She'd ordained not in Burma, I think in Nepal. And my teacher, who had the capacity to see what was happening from a long distance, let's say, uh, he actually told me that maybe I should come back because there was a slight danger there of being associated with her. So there was definitely a lot of tension around it in Burma, I would say. In Sri Lanka, I think it's... Uh, there were about a 1,000 bhikkhunis or so, and I think it's, it's more widespread and maybe a little bit more accepted... But there's still a lot of resistance to it as well, and there are still a lot of areas where um, women are not, monastic women, bhikkhunis, are not treated um, with equality, such as getting identity cards or free bus passes or whatever other state benefits that monks might get. So there's still a need for many women, even bhikkhunis, to depend on family and to depend on their own wealth from the past. 
Um, so this is one of the big problems because obviously you need a support system to, to renounce into. Um, so where else? In Thailand, it's getting a little bit better. I mean, not politically. I think there's still a law against it. There's a Sangha Act against it. But there are some bhikkhuni monasteries with very powerful bhikkhuni leaders, like Venerable Dhammananda Bhikkhuni. Um, and there's another bhikkhuni place, which I've forgotten the name of right now, Dhamma something, in Chiang Mai, with also quite a powerful bhikkhuni teacher. So there are about, I think it's about 80 bhikkhunis in Thailand. So it's really a drop in the ocean, it's not many. Um, the way that male sangha treat me, I honestly haven't really noticed, because I guess I tend to stay pretty much around my own teachers. Um, I mean, obviously we can see here that Bhante is very supportive, and it's really refreshing and very uplifting for me to, to meet a monk like you, Bhante. Full respect. And there are other monks, also Venerable Damasami in Oxford is very supportive and apparently he even put on his website that he supports our project, which I didn't know. <laughs> there are monks like Bhikkhu Bodhi, Bhante Analio, the scholars of the world who've done a lot of research on bikini ordination and fully, fully endorse and approve it, also from the texts, from a textual perspective. Um, and I guess I don't really ask permission of the rest. <laughs> I just get on with my life. I just get on with what I do. <laughs> and if I do that with respect and with humility, not creating any problems for anyone, then perhaps over time they'll think, okay, it's not such a threat. So, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> so, uh, Flavio has a question. Dear Venerable Chanda, thank you very much for sharing your experience and thank you much for organizing the talk. You're welcome. Um, you mentioned uh, in service in your talk, I really like serving because it feels really good okay. and I see purpose in it. But sometimes I feel overwhelmed because it seems that I keep myself busy with trying to serve and therefore don't feel that practicing yeah. as a result. Can you maybe give some advice about finding a wholesome balance on the path? Yeah, good. Good question. I guess my first uh, advice is to have a regular sitting practice so that you have something to come back to every evening and you have something to wash your mind with every morning too. And again, I'm very grateful to Goenkji for this because from the very first course or from my second course I could actually do it, he advised to sit two hours a day, no matter what, no matter what. And he explained it that way, that you want to wash yourself. You'd, you'd go and have a shower, right, every day. Or you'd eat something every day. So in the same way, our mind needs food every day. And after sleep, you're a bit groggy. You've got all these impressions from dreams or from snoring. I don't know what else you do in bed. So you clear your mind. You freshen up the mind first thing. And the same thing at the end of the day. You go back and you sit. And even if you sit and your mind's full of thoughts and you feel really agitated, it doesn't matter, you're letting it settle, you're just not adding to it, yeah, you're just letting it process. So this is what I would say, and also to remember to practice self-compassion, because I notice in myself it's much easier to have compassion for others, and then I sometimes don't notice that I myself need my own care and kindness, yeah, and also if you're serving a lot, you might take on some of the suffering of others, so Give that attention in yourself. Don't try and bypass it, but just try and meet it kindly. And um, give yourself some of that loving attention that you too need. Yeah, and, and remind, remember that that is going to make you more able to serve um, in a truly effective, beneficial way. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Chanda. We have Samantha who is here to ask you a question. Okay. Uh, Samantha? Yes, uh, thank you. Hi, Venerable Chanda. Hi. Um, I must say that was a beautiful talk and um, very inspirational and I was really motivated um, to learn the Dhamma. Um, and, but I, I just missed the first bit. when uh, I just wanted to find out who was Venerable Chanda's uh, first teacher uh, when she went to Burma and how did um, she find... Um, the teacher okay and and also whilst in Burma did Venerable Chanda um, experience any prejudices as a woman 
by others in, in the country, especially the, the lay people, uh -huh. and also maybe some of the monks. Uh -huh. And uh, how was um, Venerable Chanda perceived by and treated by the lay community? Okay. And lastly, um, because it was such a beautiful story, would Venerable Chanda one day consider even writing a book? <gasps> um, <laughs> not, put you, not, not meaning to put you under pressure, but... Uh, <laughs> <maybe more. laughs> thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. When we have the perfect ending to the book, then I shall write the book. <laughs> Perhaps title the Bikini Monastery, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah, my first teacher was called Sayadaw Upanyajata, and I heard about him because I was still very involved with the Goenka scene, and I wanted to find a teacher within that sort of system, so to speak. And um, one year after my first year of university, I went to India to do my. I used to spend like the three months always in Asia because it was my home, really. Um, and I was doing this retreat and somebody told me about a Burmese monk who was practicing in that tradition but who had very, very deep practice. Yes, so I knew he wasn't a normal person, he really was, you know, somebody who was realized in the Dhamma and that they wanted to start a forest monastery in Burma. And a forest monastery doesn't mean there's a thick forest, it just means it's a place which is rural and quiet and dedicated to meditation. So I was literally jumping for joy when this person told me. I just couldn't believe it because, as I say, I've been looking for 10 years and she said that her friend had already been there for two weeks and, and taken temporary ordination. So I just was kind of, in, what do you say, I couldn't contain myself. I was just over the moon. So, as I say, I went back to complete that year, but I went away to take temporary ordination the next year. Um... So yeah, that's my first teacher. And then the question about um, how I was treated in Burma, I can only say really positive things, I must say. I love that country. The people were incredibly humble, very, very generous. And for the first time in my travels, probably the first time in my travels in Asia, I felt absolutely safe as a woman, really safe. You could say part of it's due to the military rule, maybe, but I also think it was mostly due to the sila that people kept, the virtue that was in most people's hearts. You know, it's a very strongly Buddhist country. Something like how Thailand may have been in the distant past. But, I mean, in Thailand you can find forest monasteries, but they're hidden. Whereas in Burma they're just everywhere. I mean, on every street corner there's a temple. And there are many, many practice monasteries as well. So you would see monks and nuns in the streets, just walking down the road and... There was just this feeling of it's so normal, it's so integrated into, into life. Yeah. And I think also a lot of Burmese people respected me for being a Westerner and they'd say things like, if you're coming all this way to practice, then surely we should be practicing. So they'd actually take it as an inspiration, which was really touching because, of course, their sort of understanding of the path was really deep. And the Burmese people had an incredible ability in samadhi. I noticed that they could just sit there for hours and just get into really deep meditation. So this was really inspiring to me. Um, and as I say, my teacher gave me full respect. I mean, when he ordained me, he said, OK, you know, officially you can't be a bhikkhuni, but to all extents and purposes you are. You can live like a bhikkhuni. And he trained me that way. I mean, he made sure, for example, that there'd always be a chaperone if I was speaking to a male. I mean, I didn't even, I suppose we didn't even speak to males really, but he would always just be sort of around if it did happen. It was really amazing. So I had the sense that, you know, he was giving me all the conditions I needed for my liberation. So, yeah. But as I say, there's not a bigger container. So when you leave one monastery, that isn't necessarily going to be replicated somewhere else. This is the problem. Yeah. Thank you, Venerable Chanda. Thank um, you. Can we have an update on the Anukampa Bikini project? What's okay. Yeah, so I don't know how many people here know about our project. Maybe quite oh, a few. Please, Venerable Chanta, please let's tell them about the Bikini Tell them from the start? Yeah. yeah? Yeah. Okay, so I came over here in end of 2015 on holiday, meaning to go back to Perth. But as Ajahn Bowen said, just check out whether there's interest. I did. And a few people said, we really want this to happen. Shortly after that, I spoke to Ajahn Brahm and said, would you come here to teach? Because I can't do it unless you do. And also, you know, I always come to you for advice, so can you be our spiritual advisor? 
And to my amazement, he just said, sure. Which is very rare for Ajahn Brahm because he has so many requests, he just says no to everything. But, you know, I am his close disciple, so I guess he also had this interest in starting something in England, where he's from. So the first year we organised his tour, and um, it was a great success, a lot of work, but very joyful. And we got our first big donation from one person, actually, gave £400,000, which is just incredible. And that was the time I realised, my goodness, this could actually happen. And not only it could happen, but I have kind of a responsibility now to make it happen. <laughs> so this was the first kind of real show of interest and support. And we continued to organise these tours for the next few years. And then last year, we were finally in a position to buy, not buy, to rent a base. So last year, we found this little place in Oxford. And we chose Oxford because it's quite accessible for people. It's not in the middle of a noisy, smelly city. It's actually a very pleasant city. But it's also within uh, an hour's train ride from London. And so for people in London, it's easy to get to, but it also feels like a break. It feels like, oh, great, I'm away from the city, there's parks. It's, it's very multicultural too, which is important to me, and quite progressive in its thinking. You know, there's rainbow flags everywhere, and um, lots of Black Lives Matter protests were happening here. So it's an intelligent place, you know, with a lot of um, energy, and quite a few Dhamma groups as well. So this is the first really big step for us. For three years, I had nowhere to stay. I stayed with various people, like Anna, who I can see here. Um, and I just went from home to home with various lay people who I'd meet along the way. And when I look back now, I can't believe I sort of survived it, really, because I had to work really hard as well, sometimes 10 hours a day on admin and, you know, organising retreats and volunteer management, website, everything. Um, so getting this base was a real amazing step. And since last year, January, I've been able to have guests come and stay. So guests have been here to support me, to attend to the cooking and other things which I cannot do, like handling money and, you know, I think that's it really, cooking and handling money. And, uh, yeah, obviously with the COVID, things changed rather a lot because I was going to have, like, a succession of guests and I was even going to have another bikini visit me from Perth. Um, but all that had to be cancelled because of the COVID, and so now I'm staying here alone. But the project has continued to take to gain momentum because we've been doing these Zoom sessions every week, like teaching sessions two or three times a week, and I feel that that's broadened a sense of community. But I'm excited to see what happens next and whether that will actually translate into support on the ground or more volunteers, maybe more people expressing an interest in ordaining. We'll see. So there are many, many strands to it, um, but it's happening. <laughs> and uh, hopefully once I do have, you know, at least an aspirant or another lay person on the ground, we can think about moving more rurally and starting what we would call a forest monastery. That's my wish. Wonderful. Yeah. You venerable Chanda. So to everyone who is uh, joining us today, you know, Support Venerable Chanda, I mean, this is, I think, an amazing thing because, I mean, I would wish that my mother had a place to go and sort of practice without sort of, you know, facing the drama of, you know, <laughs> that sort of comes from being petty minded and all of that. I would, of course, I would love for my mother to be able to meet Venerable Chanda one day and, you know, be in a light, actually. I'm very honest. And so, guys, go support her. Open your wallets. <laughs> Give generously. <laughs> Give generously. All right. So uh, we have another question, Venerable Chanda. Dear Venerable Chanda, thank you for thank you so much for uh, sharing your amazing insights and experiences. Would you be able to refer us to any words of the Buddha specifically regarding why women have so much more pressure on them from? Um, pressure on them from society to settle down and have children etc also if you have if you personally experience any pressure from society to conform to tradi traditional gender roles mm. and if so how were you able to stay so committed to your path mm -hmm. that's interesting i might have to ask bante about the sutta references but um 
what comes to mind from the suttas is that there's a lot about um, how to be a devoted wife, but then at the same time there's a lot about how to be a good husband too. So it's usually a bit of both, to be honest. And the Buddha does make it clear in various suttas that a woman can be just as wise as a man. I mean, it seems pretty obvious for me to say that, but he did make that clear, and that was no small thing in those days, right? Because in those days, it wasn't perceived that way, and there was a lot of danger to women, especially women who would travel alone. And for a woman to, you know, shave the head and go forth, I'm sure, was really going against society's expectations very much. So I think the Buddha was actually did encourage gender equality and did respect women equally as men. I think a lot of stuff came in later, maybe at later um, Sangha councils, that you know may account for some of the sexist flavour in some of the suttas. I don't think those pl- things are mostly original to the Buddha's teaching. Um, yeah, could I ask Bante if you'd like to add anything to that part of the question? Um, with regards to the sutra references, of course we do find sutras uh, on both uh, speaking of the benefit, speaking on the benefit, or rather the um, the the um, how to be a husband, how to be a son, how to be a good wife. But we also do find sutra references who, which would then go beyond the conventional norms and would say find happiness, right? And the Buddha seems to always draw our attention to finding happiness in a very substantial, in a way that it sort of prolongs, not the sort of the short-term happiness, but a long-term sort of happiness. And that is what, so although we do have some sutras which do say, you know, be this, be that, or rather if you are, it doesn't say be this, be that, rather it says if you are a wife, how to be a good wife, if you are a husband, how to be a good husband, if you are a child, how to be that. It, it to me it seems that it has effects on or it draws from doing whatever that you're doing in a good wholesome manner mm. right whoever you are whatever you are doing and being a person who is a person who gives back to society who leaves or sort of radiates one light as well as being a good person that you are happy to close your eyes with you know at the end of the night <laughs> you know please my understanding, Melba Chanda. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Bante. Yeah, that's a beautiful um, perspective. Right. So we have another question. We have another question. Yeah, I'm wondering, there was another part to that one. Could I just um, continue? Because I think they were asking me about my experience as well, in terms yes. of um, feeling any kind of pressure to go the conventional way. And um, it's a subtle thing, because I think in the West we can sometimes feel that there isn't pressure and that women are not seen only as mothers and wives and bearers of children. But I did notice, even in my own family, that there was this kind of sadness that I wasn't going to bring forward a grandchild. Um, And I also think that it it isn't considered that cool to be a nun. I want to change that. I like my hat and I like my teddy bear and I hope that I'm kind of accessible so you can say I'm cool. But generally, (laughs) I'm just kidding, generally... Being a monk is considered quite cool, like it's really a statement, it's like a very cool thing, like the wise old monk is an archetype, but we don't have a wise old non, that's considered a bit sad, right, isn't it? That's considered like um, a non, oh she sort of didn't work out quite right for her, maybe there was a failed marriage, or there aren't so many um, references to the wisdom of women I would say, and I think as a result it's not considered generally such a great thing (laughs) I don't know I don't know if other people feel that but I definitely do feel it's not people don't get excited in the same way they do about monks I found it a lot harder work being a nun (laughs) well well well, Melchanda thank you so much I mean (laughs) I mean what an absolute gem um and you know, uh, to any of you who want to learn more about what Wendell Chanda is doing, please visit anukampaproject.org and all the events are there, how you can make a donation to support the Bikuni uh, project in the UK, which is the first of its kind, I think, in, would, would it be right if I say in the whole, to the whole of Europe? No, yeah. there are Bikuni places in Europe, but um, yeah, okay. this is in Britain, yeah. 
So, uh, so make sure you go check out what, what they are offering, the classes, the courses, and support them in whatever ways. Sometimes even if you can't give money or make a charitable donation that way, you can still, I guess, uh, volunteer, right? Volunteer Absolutely. and be a part of And there are so many ways that you could. So Venerable Chanda, I'm so glad that Doriba, your friend, my friend, yeah. so put us together. Uh, a lot of our mutual friends have been saying, you know, you should meet Venerable Chanda, you should. And I've been like, why should I be meeting her? And they've been like, you know, she's all smiles, you're all smiles. You know, you... <laughs> That's so lovely. <laughs> So, Bikuri Chanda, I'm not letting you go. I'm going to invite you again and again, and I hope that Aww. we accept our invitations and sort of do that. We can sort of continue and um, and and please know that you always will have a home in Colchester, Essex, at the Dharma Centre, right? And we are always here to support you if there is any need to. Uh, so, we wish you all the very best, Chanda, Venerable Chanda, in 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 all your endeavours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Bente, and I want to thank you too and say how beautiful it is to connect through smiles, and um, it's very touching that you've extended such a warm welcome and also to your place in Colchester, and you may actually see that someday a bikini will come through, and equally I would love to invite you here any time that you know, there are the facilities for that. As soon as I have guests again, you'd be very, very welcome. So. Thank you, and uh, yes, it'll be wonderful to stay in touch. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And um, just to let everyone, uh, just to let everyone know, we at the Dhamma Center, we do have six cl uh, classes running six days a week, from meditation courses, up Dhamma, Sutra study, all of that. We also do have speakers that we invite time to time, like Venerable Chanda, people who do inspire practice uh, for all of you to find your path and travel on your path, because at the end of the day, um, everything else does not matter. It is your happiness. It is the path that we create for ourselves. And we, you know, like Venerable Chanda from the uh, Arusampa Beacon Project and from the Dhamma Center, what we try to do is support your path and practice. So please check out the Dhamma Center website. And if you would like to keep, be kept informed of our future activities, talks, etc., subscribe to the Dhamma Center and you will be receiving updates on whenever we do have talks and hopefully when we have Venerable Chandra back with us to give another talk. 